Okay, so we got another uh, video answer key here for Chemistry 241, and in this case, we're going to take on a quiz that we had in class not too long ago, and I think this one's pretty short. I, I, I think most of you did pretty well, but still, I'll go ahead and walk you through very quickly uh, some of the key points, and might clear up some confusion if you're not uh, really sure on how to read the frost, frost diagrams and some of the other things. So let's dive right in. So this first one, we're talking about uh, what's going on here. We got titanium, vanadium, and chromium, and if you look on your periodic table, you'll see these are uh, 3D metals, as are cobalt, nickel, and copper, they differ in their placement along the row, right? And so if you look across, and you'll see titanium, vanadium, and chromium are, are far to the, the, the left side of the D block, right? And if you keep going along uh, the row there, you'll see that cobalt, nickel, and copper are very far to the right side of the D block. And so here we see that uh, these early transition metals, right? That's the term for ones that are further to the left. Um, early transition metals favor this 3 plus oxidation state that's given to you and here it says cobalt, nickel, and copper though they only favor the 2 plus and so when you look at this you have to say okay what's going on here well 3 plus versus 2 plus that means um, in this case that means energetically it's more stable to only remove two electrons rather than three and so it's not a question of how many electrons are available because obviously cobalt, nickel, and copper have many more uh, valence electrons in the D subshell than the early ones. However, um, why is it that you can remove three for these early transi transition metals and only two from the late transition metals? And it goes back to the idea of periodic trends, right? As you go from left to right across a row of the periodic table, what happens? Well, as you go from left to right from the early transition metals, right? We can say early transition metals to the late transition metals, Right? And those are terms you should remember from class. As you go from left to right, what happens? Well, they get smaller, right? So the size gets smaller. And why is that? That's because as you move from left to right, you're adding protons, which is increasing the nuclear charge, which is Z, right? But you're also adding an electron. And you're adding that electron in the outer valence shell. And outer valence shell electrons do not shield. So when you add that proton, you're not also canceling that out by adding an electron, which is what some people want to say, and that's totally not true, because you're not adding any more shielding, right? And so what happens is the Z effective, or the effective, right, the effective, remember to write this, effective uh, nuclear, right, charge, increases, and that's really important. What is that? Well, the effective nuclear charge is equal to, mathematically, the charge on uh, the nucleus, which in this case is number of protons, minus the shielding, right? And that's really important, the shielding. Sorry about my gar terrible garbage handwriting here. Um, maybe I can do this a little bit better. Uh, there we go. My pen's not uh, behaving very well today, I apologize. So effective nuclear charge is the nuclear charge, that is the number of protons on the nucleus, right? Minus the shielding of the core electrons. And that's really important. Only the core are the most effective shielders. The core electrons are really important. So if you're adding an electron to the valence, they're not really good shielders. So that means every proton you add really increases the nuclear charge the shielding is not compensating for that very well because you're adding an electron to the valence shell so that effective, nu nu effective nuclear charge goes way up as you go from left to right which means the size goes down and if you're removing electrons from something that's smaller energetically uh, you're trying to pull more electrons away from a higher charge it's going to be energetically just not favorable so you can only get away with removing two as your most stable state whereas earlier on in the early transition metals you could get away with moving, removing more than two. Granted, three is not much more than two, but it makes a difference, and so that's really important. So for the early transition metals, in this case, plus three versus a plus two for the late transition metals. And again, you didn't have to memorize that, but the idea is that I give you some data, and you have to think about some underlining, underlying themes of what's going on. And so periodic trends from 111 would be a really good thing to review for this course. And again, effective nuclear charge, I cannot overstate how powerful of a concept that is for explaining a lot of trends in terms of behavior of the periodic table and the elements. Okay, so if we go uh, to the next one here, I'm gonna zoom down, this deals with the frost diagram, right? The frost, 
uh, Ebsworth diagram here. And so what do we got here? Well, we got, I think it's really important to note that energy on this y-axis, and then we've got a variety of oxidation states. In this case, they're all manganese, right? So you can see uh, these are gonna be high in energy, and then these are gonna be low in energy. And remember, nature loves to favor downhill. Lower in energy is a spontaneous process. And if you want to, you can just put free energy over here, but I'm just gonna put an E for energy over here. It's pretty simple. Um, remember this from the notes shows you that it connects to delta G, it connects to um, the cell potential that you can measure and relate that through electrochemistry to delta G. So these are actually measured in lab and they're very, very powerful. Um, the numbers on the y-axis aren't so important. Don't worry so much about the units of what the numbers are. What you're really looking for is high energy versus low energy and how that relates to the individual oxidation states. And so what you can do is you can prove it to yourself. Here's a plus seven. This manganese, right, this whole thing, this is called permanganate, has a negative one charge. And if we know that oxygen is a negative two, two times negative, uh, sorry, four times negative two is negative eight, that means we've got to compensate, so that is indeed a seven plus, and that gives you the overall net charge of negative one. Eight minus seven, one left over, the eight is negative, so that's why you have a negative there, and so on and so forth. And so you can look here, some are just given to you, right? The three plus and the two plus, and then this one, of course, is just elemental neutral, so we put a little zero up there if you want to. If there's nothing there, it's implied that it's neutral, so there you go. Now. This one says give the name of the least stable. If the least stable is gonna be high energy or low energy? Yeah, it's gonna be high energy. That's the least stable. It wants to go downhill to become more stable in energy. So, and then we call this one, this is gonna be MnO4 minus, we call that per manganate. And that's gonna be one of the polyatomics, the uh, ions that you need to know. Uh, some of you learned it in 111, and, and now it's the part of our set that you have to know for this, this exam. So that information's on Canvas if you want the full list of ones you have to know. The formula of the most stable ion, the most stable is gonna be the lowest energy, right? The, this is the, the minimum in energy right here. So if we look at that, that's as low as you can go. So the formula for this one is pretty easy. This is gonna be manganese, two plus. And then it says give the formula the strongest oxidizing agent. This is a little bit of a review, review from 111. Oxidizing agents are reduced. That means they gain electrons, right? Reduction is gain. If you're reduced, you are an oxidizing agent. So which one of these oxidation states most favorably in terms of energy would like to gain an electron? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. The seven plus, that is by far the most positive most um, you know electron hungry manganese and so it wants to gain electrons to reduce its oxidation state and become more stable so if it's uh, more likely to be reduced that makes it a strong oxidizing agent so once again that is our friend uh, permanganate and it is a very famous um, oxidizing agent in fact we use that in lab when you did week two of your uh, compound or complex uh, analysis and you did a redox titration with permanganate, right? That's really important. This last one's really easy. It says, is this reaction spontaneous? And I could have picked any points on this diagram, but I picked manganese three and manganese two. So manganese three is right here. Manganese two is right here. And if I go downhill, that's gonna be reducing my energy, right? That means essentially you can think about negative delta G if we call this a delta G axis. So you could say negative delta G, right, for the reaction. And we all remember, hopefully, from 111 that that is indeed spontaneous. You're going downhill in energy. And again, I can pick, I could have picked any of these, these points. I could have picked manganese zero going to manganese two, and that would have been spontaneous. I could have picked seven going to, to four. You get the idea. So make sure you can read these diagrams. They're, they're really important, and they tell you a lot. And you can look these up for many, many, many different materials. And um, you know, knowing how to read one of these is really important. So that being said, I tried to keep this short. I know I kind of rambled a little bit, but hopefully it helps you with your understanding. So um, again, if you have questions, come see us, uh, and we'd be happy to answer questions or um, work some more problems or whatever we can do to help you feel more confident. So there you go. Catch you next time.